Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our first of a few uh, budget meetings. I'm going to call the meeting to order. I'm going to ask uh, any disclosure of pecuniary interest. Uh, please say, say so right now. So hearing none, uh, so we're going to have a resolution here to move into the Committee of Whole, moved by Councilor Dirksen, seconded by Councilor Elliott, that the Town of Minto Council convenes in the Committee of Whole of the whole to conduct budget deliberations. All in favor of that? That's carried. Thank you. So um, reports of committees and staff, nothing, nothing there. So we're going to get right into uh, the discussions of the budget today, unless there's anybody that has hesitations. So this is uh, our operating budget and um, it's uh, it's going to be a tough year. Everybody knows all about some of our our obstacles in reference to CPI and inflation and fuel prices and chemical prices and salt, all the other items. I mean, we have that same issue uh, down at the county as well. Last weekend when we were talking about the budget. So today, again, we are talking about the operating budget and I'd like to thank everybody for coming and, and thank the staff for uh, working so hard on this budget. <coughs> Uh, Chris and Mark, I know that uh, we had a little bit of a, a look at this budget last week. And so without any further ado, um, this is going to help us achieve our goals over the next year. So where are we starting? Uh, we'll start at uh, budget 2023 operating presentation to council by our staff. Go ahead, Mark. It is my pleasure to kick off the 2023 budget process. I would like to start by thanking staff for all of their work in preparing the budget before council today. It has been a very challenging process. The town is facing inflationary pressures in almost er all areas of operations. With the increased cost of fuel, materials, outside services and insurance premiums, staff have continued to look for efficiencies in the delivery of the important services to the residents of Minto. The theme for this year's budget is a year of planning. Staff will embark on updating various plans that will position the town for success in the years to come. We have a few quotes which emphasize the importance of planning. From Alexander Graham Bell, before anything else, preparation is the key to success. From Alan Lakin, planning is bringing the future into the present so that you can do something about it now and from Brian Tracy, every minute you spend in planning saves 10 minutes in execution. That gives you a 1000% return on energy. The budget process is scheduled to take place over three days with January 17th focused on the proposed 2023 operating budget. On February 21st, we will review any changes or updates from today's meeting and present council with the proposed 2023 capital budget. A budget open house will be held on March 7th from 5 to 6 p.m. where department heads will be available to answer any questions on the 2023 operating and capital budgets and the linkages to the services that they deliver. The process for the budget meeting today is for each department to present their 2023 goals and objectives, discuss the major items impacting the 2023 budget and, any, and answer any questions council may have. Additional details are available from the documents attached to the council agenda that outline responsibilities, budget changes and service measures for the various service and program areas. With the direction from today's meetings and the capital budget meeting scheduled for February 21st, the treasurer will prepare a final budget bylaw for consideration at the council meeting scheduled for March 21st. There are various plans that guide the town of Minto in the delivery of service services to the residents. The strategic plan is the overarching document which feeds into the various departmental or functional plans, which in turn drives the departmental business plans. For 2023, staff is planning to update various plans, including the strategic plan, the parks and recreation master plan, the economic development master plan, and the cultural master plan to name a few. 
The following slide lists the town's vision and mission statements. The mission statement defines our business, our objectives, and our approach to reach those objectives. The vision statement details where we continue to aspire to go and provides words of guidance and inspiration. I will now turn things over to Treasurer Duff, who will walk us through the next part of the presentation. Thank you, Mark. Welcome, Treasurer Duff. Great. Uh, thanks, Mark. And uh, it's nice to be here. Um, so I just want to preface, I, uh, a few hours ago, I, I had the opportunity to talk uh, directly with the Minister of Finance uh, regarding our challenges. And uh, our local MPP was in attendance, too. And uh, it, it, certainly, I didn't have an original message or anything, but I did mention um, that today I'd be presenting, I believe it's my 22nd budget for the town of Minto, and this has been by far the most challenging. Um, and I kind of outlined where we are, what our tax levy is, what our um, future budget looks like, what our asset management plan says it should look like, and uh, the levels of debt and the tax increases that we have put in place. So we we are committed and uh, our taxpayers and ratepayers are, are tapped out and we need help from our partners who have access to uh, much more revenue than we do. So um, that was a very common theme, not only among the municipal sector, but certainly the healthcare and uh, various business councils too. So um, I think this document shows that, that staff has uh, worked to try and mitigate the best we can. Um, there's so many uncontrollables, but we'll focus on what we can control. So on page six, we have uh, the 21 actuals, 22 approved budget, and where we are in 23. So you'll see we, we have some decreases in some departments, um, sometimes from uh, moving staff around or reducing initiatives. Uh, but then, uh, as, as Mark uh, leaned into, we have all those pressers. And again, we've said many times we're, we're in the property management and, and fleet business. And uh, we're all uh, homeowners or renters, and we all know the pressers that uh, we are facing. So just going through each, each department, um, that's brought us to a 5.45% increase. And... Uh, as what we started in 22, we're trying to anticipate some of the tax growth that will accrue to the town of Mental. Um, but generally, like the MPAC has improved greatly, but it's probably a one to two year delay. And as you know, our building department has been incredibly busy and uh, the effect of those building permits and the assessed properties, uh, we estimate that our share for this coming year will be about 75,000. So that mitigates the total increase down to 4.88%, which uh, I, I heard today that the inflation rate dropped to 6.3 is good, but it's not there yet. And, and this rate would be below uh, inflation. And, and I believe municipal inflation is much higher than 7%. So the next page uh, is just a, a summary of water and wastewater which as we know, we're mandated to have it on a cost recovery basis. And we do that through uh, putting money into and taking out of reserves to uh, come to zero. Um, high level on the pressers and mitigation. Uh, as a reminder, our, our total tax levy is approximately 5.8 million. So 1% is about $58,000. So that kind of gives you a, a context of materiality. Um, we'll, we'll look at uh, these things in detail, but we do have uh, net proposed staff additions uh, of uh, 147,500. So that leaves for 2.56% total levy. So in the far right column, you'll see um, the impact of each line and, and where we are. Um, for COLA, we have a policy of the September CPI and that happened to be 6.9. So if we followed that, uh, that would be another 5.41%. Um, we're proposing outsourcing uh, bylaw 
Um, our bylaw, I, I think, is up by uh, about two to three times. And also uh, the types of calls, um, which I think council's very well aware of, has been more challenging. And I think we want to cooperate with one of our neighbors and, and try and outsource that and uh, reallocate that staff resort to the fire department. Fuel, uh, again, uh, total guess, um, but we're uh, anticipating uh, probably further increases, uh, hopefully moderate uh, 22. We were here a year ago, no one thought it would go up like that. We just had 69 cents a liter for gasoline, went up to 235, now it's back down to about the 150 mark. Um, but that's our best guess. So that's another 1.28%. Utilities, uh, fortunately, we're deferring the full effect on the town because we do heads part of our natural gas and part of our electricity. And some of that goes into 23. Um, that figure will probably be a little bit bigger for 24, but that's 0.34. Insurance coverage. We don't have our uh, actual renewal documents. I can't give you an exact figure. Um, we were hoping it was going to be around 15. The latest we've heard is around 20. Um, could be more. I hope it's less, but um, that's another 1%. And then all the other factors uh, are about 0.79. So if we did nothing, that would give us a nice 12% increase. Um, we do not feel that is acceptable, and I'm sure our residents don't either. So what we're proposing is to cap the COLA increase to 4%. Um, it's a real fine line between uh, staff retention and being fiscally responsible too. So we are proposing a 4% cap for 23 with uh, the option to carry forward the 2.9 to a future year. Um, the rest, basically it's maneuvering money to and from reserves. Um, I have to say that the last four are nothing that any of us really want to do because we really believe in, in adding to reserves, not taking away. But um, if it's a rainy day fund, it's a rainy day. So we're proposing to, to mitigate and draw down. Uh, that would take us to 6.19. And again, factoring in the expected assessment growth uh, that's another 1.3, so that's how we got to 4.88. And then the next one. So again, um, on our uh, mythical, typical average residential house, which I realize is well below market value, but that is assessed value, and that's we're into our seventh year of the four-year cycle. So we're saying that's about 250,000. Um, so the 4.88 is roughly $24 per household. The county, uh, our best uh, guess is they're still going to be at 3.8. Again, you can get shifts within uh, assessment classes and between assessment classes. Um, the province also announced the school board is holding PAT with 0% change. Um, that's very good for Minto because again, it's set on a provincial basis and uh, often southwestern Ontario has been growing a little bit slower. So we do have this figure of 2086 for 100,000. Uh, I always like to preface that 100,000 in Minto is not 100,000 in Pushments because even at today's values, that's probably a quarter to a, a fifth of an actual house. And yeah, it's probably way less than 10% of a, an actual house's value in the south end of the county. So just a, a global outlook, um, started doing this last year, uh, things paint a pretty good picture right now. Uh, unemployment has really fallen uh, in almost all countries, um, as you can see by the graph, um, which on the whole is good. And, and you're looking at, especially the European countries, it's good, but they still have a lot of people that are not working. Um, in Canada and around here, we know the unemployment rate is quite low. And uh, in the old days, we would call that full employment too. So. Um, and the uh, deficit forecast, again, I think it's been a pleasant surprise to 
uh, all levels of government and, and looking at the provinces here, that the economy has held up much better during COVID than they thought. And so that's led to uh, more tax revenue um, and uh, maybe a little less demand on social services too, as uh, federal money and uh, jobs are uh, keeping people employed. So um, the, the federal and provincial deficits are down quite a bit. Um, real GDP growth, uh, again, there's certain countries that really uh, affect the overall global economy. Um, China, as far as you can uh, tweak the figures, um, they still grew at 4.4%, which is a decent rate. South Korea is doing very well. Um, I'm happy to see that Russia shrunk. Um, and the USA kept up. Um, again, Canada is, is doing quite well at, at 3.9%. So uh, right now we're we may be heading into a recession, but we're coming off a pretty good uh, level of, of growth and stuff for employment. Uh, next is our uh, organ organizational structure, which uh, hasn't changed uh, here. And staff complement. So here's where we're looking at. Uh, as I mentioned, we're looking at outsourcing uh, plan or, uh, bylaw enforcement. So that would the uh, point six position out of building and planning and into fire and emergency and uh, community services. Again, they've been re running very lean and mean and they're very tired. So uh, a new operator would be most welcome. And there. And then we're looking at uh, the asset management plan just to reinforce, we just brought that uh, to council for the core assets in September. Um, and uh, that showed the $7.9 million. So again, core is roads, water, wastewater, stormwater. And going back to our 2017 plan for all the other assets, it was at $4 million. Those figures are probably very low, but uh, that's theoretically what we should be spending. Um, and we're also looking at the condition of assets. And uh, as alluded in the overall presentation, a year of planning. So assets are just used to deliver services. So we want to consult with the community again and hear what that level is. Um, breakdown of tax dollars, again, based on the previous year, but it should be pretty consistent. Um, our share is roughly 38%, education 16, and the county 46. Um, so I know for the average person, they're just writing the check to the town of Minto, but we don't get to keep all of it. <coughs> and again, for, where the money goes, taxpayers support it, so water and wastewater is not in there. Um, no surprise, it's you know public works, community services, fire, and admin uh, account for the lion's share of all the things that we do. Um, OMPF, again, I'm happy to say that we know these figures. Uh, one advantage to waiting a little longer, uh, more comes out. So our uh, o OMPF did drop by 33,000, you know, roughly half a point, um, but it's still a, it's at a sizable level, but we're about where we were in 2014 in, in nominal dollars too. And uh, we're very uh, appreciative of that grant and you know, we say, keep lobbying to keep it going. Um, OCIF, so they're moving towards uh, basing this on actual replacement costs of assets for another reason we did our uh, asset management plan update. And again, glad to say that uh, Minto went up by $150,000, which is the maximum cap. Um, the minister again announced uh, this morning that the OCIF envelope is doubling, uh, but it's being phased in over uh, five years. So hopefully that'll continue. So we are up in grants by 115,000, which is very good, but uh, 115,000 doesn't go as far as it used to either. So, um, And we did drop our, our tax supported reserve contributions a bit, but we still have uh, in there to put in $633,000. Um, wish it was more, but uh, at least we, we have that much in there. 
So now just looking at administration, administration covers finance and clerks. And as I always say, everything that uh, doesn't go to some other department <laughs> ends up in admin. Um, so we're still looking for finance, uh, improving our budget system uh, and our purchasing policy, um, looking more at long-term financial plans because we're quite aware of what we need to spend, but uh, we have to come up with a way of funding as much of it as we can. Uh, asset management, again, we're uh, just finishing up a project with FCM uh, for enhancements such as the uh, citizen request portal and uh, route patrol and uh, GIS. And I, again, our, our public works uh, department has worked closely with the county and citywide to improve that. And I think we've got about 80% of our assets tied in and that helps all, all the departments do. Um, not directly a town thing, but as you know, we're a guarantee for the Minto Municipal Services Corporation. And going by the last email I saw, we should get to Dustin and that within the week. <laughs> so that's good. And then we'll have to finalize the mortgage. Um, we've been spending a lot of time uh, and dollars on cybersecurity and uh, trying to reach uh, uh, a better level of uh, firewall protection and viruses. Um, the bad guys are getting smarter, so we need to try and stay on top of it. Um, and of course, we'll, all departments will participate in all the reviews of the plan. Um, I don't know if Ann Lean wants to do number 22 one here, but I'll, I'll do everything else there. Um, so in summary, um, moving around uh, staff a bit, uh, mayor and council have the enhanced benefits and uh, Actually, we do not have an election this year, so we can decrease that. Um, reserve transfers being dropped in, in that, so uh, that reduced that. People and property is basically your conservation levies and uh, a little bit of other uh, protection and, and monitoring. And health and social services, that's some of our donations and uh, supporting other facilities such as the food bank and that too. So this has a positive contribution to the budget request with a drop of 1.2%. So take any questions and Ann Lean can fill in some clerk details. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> thank you Gord. Linda Wicker, Graham, are you next up? Yep. Continuing along with Gord's trend of uh, reducing the budget, happy to be here today. Uh, so our goals and objectives for 2013, uh, we've talked a lot about planning and uh, we're due for an update to our culture plan, which was created in 2011 and one of the first rural municipalities to do so. Um, so we're looking forward to getting that updated this year, as well as our economic first ever economic development plan. We've always done business retention plans, downtown revitalization plans, and this will kind of encompass all of that. As you all know, diversity, equity, and inclusion is a key focus, not only for our department, but I believe the town as a whole, being that our vision includes inclusivity as a key element. Uh, so working with the committee, which we have five applicants already, and uh, working on the action plan there, Everyone knows workforce and housing continues to be a challenge, so continue to be a priority for us, as well as work in business retention, expansion, and attraction. So as uh, we looked at earlier, our department is helping bring the budget down by 7.7%, .7%, and the big uh, component there that's helping reduce that is we are dropping our CIP loan program, grant program, down by about $30,000. Last year, we didn't see as much uptake, um, so we have lowered that this year, knowing the challenges that our businesses are having, many struggling to stay open uh, for, a, for a variety of reasons. Um, we're not hopeful that this will have a big uptake this year either, so we're comfortable with dropping that. And everything else is just up and down, small changes here and there, but overall that's the biggest change. That's all I have. So uh, I know we're uh, 
suggested how we should go with the questions. Do we want to go real time? If you have a question, uh, what do you think? Uh, I, I think just at the end of every, okay. each department able to present, and then when it comes to these questions, we encourage council to ask the questions at that point for that, or if they think of something from a previous presentation, but just let the department head go through each one. And then when we get to this slide, we encourage your questions to start coming forward. Okay, so Belinda, you're gonna continue with tours and launch it and then questions. Yeah, yeah, tourism is very straightforward and launch it is always, like Gord said with the other stuff at zero. <laughs> so uh, tourism is down slightly and that's because of revenue. We're having uh, really good events that are bringing in sponsorships and uh, good attendance and donations. So that's why that's helped out there. And then launch it even out, so. Perfect, Belinda, thank you. Questions for Belinda? Okay, well, thank you. Yeah. Building and planning, Mr. Right. Terry Kuypers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, building department's budget's always a little bit tricky. Um, a lot of times the revenue is based on the economic conditions. Um, I'm anticipating this year that things are gonna slow down slightly in typically, or I'm thinking the residential sector. Um, but having said that, I think the agricultural sector is gonna remain strong. So um, throughout this year, uh, I'm gonna be looking at uh, reworking our development approval process uh, with Bill 23 and Bill 109 changes. It's kind of messed things up. Um, so try to get that back on track to achieve essentially what we need to achieve and what we did before. Um, my budget, uh, as you'll see in the workbook, is uh, combined through the three different scopes of practice. Um, I'm looking at splitting that out uh, to the different uh, areas and then do a fee, fee review of those just to make sure we're still hitting cost recovery. Um, yep, the other thing I'm going to be working on is uh, bylaw reviews and updates for some of our older bylaws. Um, and again, linked to the development approval process, work on some new templates and uh, uh, application forms to support uh, our planning applications. Um, so budget wise, uh, the big increase in my department uh, is labor, um, but that's being offset by an increase in revenue. Um, I did mention things are probably gonna slow down this year uh, in terms of revenue, but for the last few years I've exceeded budgeted revenue. Um, so I'm happy to increase it with a conservative uh, amount um, for my revenue stream. So that is going to result in a decrease in my budget of 7.2%. So if there's any questions. Questions for Terry? So are you starting to see that right now with the residential slowing down and industrial and commercial uh, staying strong? This year, it's, uh, sorry, at this point in the year, um, it's kind of tricky to see what we're seeing locally. Uh, I'm just basing it on um, new house sales and what I've been hearing from other builders and stuff like that, that, um, that yeah, what they're, what they're experiencing, so. Okay, well, I guess it's a wait and see approach. It is, it is, so. So, Perfect. no questions, thank you, Terry. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move along to the uh, fire and emergency services. Uh, Chief Harrell, interim CAO. <laughs> Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I'm too lazy to go around to the podium, so I'll just do it from here. Um, yeah, so as you've seen, the, the fire and emergency services budget is up a little bit this year. I can't mimic the two people that were just bragging about theirs going down, but uh, the first, we want to finish the implementation of our new software and tablet program. So we have the tablets installed in our, in our trucks. Um, they're mounted, they're deployed. Um, we've kind of parked that for a bit because uh, Cleese being off of maternity leave. So when she gets back in May, hopefully, um, that's going to be one of her projects is to finish that program off and get that uh, finished off and running. Um, we'll get back to full staffing complement this year, which is nice. We'll continue to enhance the partnership with Wellington North um, and continue to monitor what goes on in the county with different uh, departments and, and ways that things are going. Uh, the master fire plan updates and a possible service review, that would be with the uh, 
with other departments in the county to look at possibly doing a service review of how fire services are, are brought forward in the county um, to see if there's any other ways to do things or better ways or what, which I'm always for someone looking at it and seeing if there's suggestions on ways that we can do things better. Um, but that would be, if it ever went forward, it would be a joint one with different municipalities to, uh, to look at that. Um, and for the master fire plan updates, it hasn't been updated since 2017. So we're due for an update. Um, and this is part of the, what we're proposing in the admin budget is to do all of the plans at once this year. And as Mark said early on, that's uh, a fulsome review of all strategic plans, culture plan, economic development master plan, do all the plans at once, have, a, have somebody come in and help us get through that process and then present council with kind of a roadmap for the rest of their term, um, which we think would be a good idea. Uh, one of the things that's new for us is we have mandatory certification. So we have to complete the legacy provisions, meaning it's a grandfather clause that existing firefighters can be grandfathered going through. Um, so that's what we need to work on this year. Uh, we have two windows, January to March, and then another one in the fall to get our applications in. Um, it will include an audit of our training records and that from the fire marshal's office. So we have to be prepared for that and complete that. So that's one of the new legislations that came down last year. There was three in total for the fire service, which has made us significantly busier. Um, it's the first time in the 15 years that I've been here that we've had that many legislation changes uh, put on, on us as fire departments. Um, the last stage of the wage increase for firefighters. So that's just giving them uh, an hourly increase, um, which hadn't been done in 10 or more years. Um, so we did it a little bit last year and we completed the last part of it this year. Um, so that's in there. And also we'll just continue to monitor our call volume increases for various trends. Um, as you know, this year our calls were up fairly significantly, which we'll get a year end report to soon. Um, but we did see a lot more calls due to a lot more medical calls and just a lot more other things happening, but medical calls are the main driver of that. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, one of the big things is um, by outsourcing uh, bylaw and bringing in more bylaw help for the town, um, we would be taking that position into the fire service, uh, which we already have half. We're just taking the other half in to make that full time in the fire in the fire department. Um, so the, yeah, that's about it for the budget. Any questions? Questions? Go ahead, Councillor Elliott. Yeah, just a couple of things, uh, Chris. Yep. Uh, Wellington North. How's that happening? Or, or is that a hope to save us money or is it efficiencies? Is that what that's all about? And how close are we to beating where we want to be with that? Um, so we're entering year three of the four years um, agreement that we signed with last council. Um, it, it, they pay us anywhere between uh, 65 and $80,000 a year. So if we lost that partnership, then that would have to, so it, the budget would go up even more. Yeah. Um, so that's that. And efficiencies is a big thing. So for example, I'm not jumping ahead, but in the capital budget, you'll see that we, we need to replace our, our air packs this year, um, which is about a $500,000 purchase for Minto. Um, we're partnering, Wellington North is doing the same at the same time, um, as well as we're trying to get uh, other departments around the area on board with that to make it a big group purchase. But so instead of a purchasing 34 for us or 35 for us, it, the number is 70 that we're just, so we're going to realize a huge efficiency there. So are they happy with our relationship with them? Or is that um, I, I believe so. Yeah. Um, I can't answer for their counsel on that um, for sure, but th there's definitely been a lot of speed bumps and a lot of uh, things that we've tried to work out. Um, not being at full staffing for a while has been tough and a lot of projects we've had to park. Um, that we will hopefully revigorate, invigorate this year. So and, we'll see, but. And you do your master plan in-house or do you outsource? Uh, the last two that we've done, we've done them all in-house. Um, one of the proposals with this is to get a consultant, but to help us with all of the plans. So the rec master plan, the strategic plan, the economic development plan, is somebody to kind of help us to oversee and to kind of guide the process. But a lot of the process would still be driven by staff and house. If we went out and did 
we believe, and, and, and Mark can back me up on this, if, if we went out and outsourced all of the plans, to, instead of consulting, you do them all, then we would be looking at significant, significant dollars. So we're just looking, hopefully, for somebody that's going to guide the process and help us kind of gather information. But a lot of the plans that we're doing that you've, that you've heard about in here, including the overall strategic plan for the town, will be guided for by staff. Right. Thanks, Chris. Go ahead, Councillor Potnovich. Through you, Mayor Turton. Um, I, just, I just have a question on uh, when I'm looking at Palmerston Fire Hall, Harrison Fire Hall, they're, uh, they're reduced uh, significantly and Clifford is up. I just want to explain why Clifford is up at 8.3 increase. Um, I will have to get back to you on that, Councillor Potnovich. I have to pull the, each bid budget sheet up. I can't think off the top of my head why one's up and one's down. Um, I will pull the budget sheets up and see, and I'll get back to you with that one. And just a follow up. Uh, um, I give a full compliment of volunteer uh, firefighters. We do right now in Minto. Yes. Um, we are looking at possibly recruiting in the fall, um, to, to fill some, a couple of vacancies that we've had, but, um, we've been lucky over the years that we have been very, uh, we've been managing full numbers um, and our retention is extremely well in Minto. Um, a lot of 25, 30 year people. So um, yeah, so we're good that way. Any other questions? I think, uh, sorry, Deputy Mayor Anderson, go ahead. That's okay. So Chris, from your perspective, the partnership with uh, Wellington North, um, how are you managing that? Are you finding it? You are, you've got a lot of hats on your head. Um, I have a big head, so I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> My wife tells me that all the time. So, <laughs> um, it, it is a lot. I will, I will agree. It is a lot, but, um, we have both there and here and, and this staff here, what makes it easier to do and manageable in my books is the staff that we have. There's really, um, the staff steps up they take on extra stuff they do a whole bunch of stuff and that so um we're managing okay um we would like to see again once we get back the full complement to see what we can really move forward with and, and really start moving the bar forward um there's a lot of things that we have in the queue that we'd like to like to do but just haven't had the horsepower to do it so and as far as the the volunteer firefighters are there are there is it beneficial to have the two together are you able to send more trucks out without pulling everybody from each fire department or does it work like that um depending on the location of the incident it depends on the location of the incident and um so instead of us having to send all three of our stations we might be able to send say harrison and mount forest up to the top end of Minto. yeah so that's that's a definitely a service enhancement and and better for us yeah um Honestly, what a lot of it is now is is we just can't turn out very many bodies sometimes. We can have 25 right. firefighters, but in the daytime, we might have three or four show up. Sure. So you have to call five stations to get enough people to, to gather. So it just hit or miss. Um, but the use of resources is another thing. Like um, they use our aerial truck a lot, and we call them with their pumpers and tankers to come in and that. So it's a trade-off that way as well that we don't – as we move forward – and even if it goes and you look in a broader perspective throughout the county, if we look at how we can work together to, instead of us having to own a whole bunch of equipment, we spread it out and sure. spread the cost. Yeah. Because one of the things that Gord pointed out with the reserves is our reserve contribution, thank goodness, survived some of the cuts. But a new pumper truck, which um, two years ago we bought for 640000 is now over a million dollars. So I, I don't know how we plan for that and how we, we try and push that out but that that's the reality and i know public works is facing the same thing but fire stuff for whatever reason has gone through the yeah. roof so the, the partnerships and even if it expands can help the whole region as far as those really expenses so theoretically i think so because in my opinion uh, a lot of municipalities won't be able to afford to have no. two no. three pumper trucks you might be able to afford one and, and then have different resources with it um, whatever that may be um, so they're going to have to look to each other to help each other out because you just can't afford to, to buy other equipment. All right. so. Fair enough. Thank you. 
think Chris, when you sorry, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Mayor uh, Tertin. Uh, just a bit of a follow up to uh, Councillor Potter. What's the thing? Clifford Fire Hall. It's a bit of the law of uh, small numbers, so a little change makes a big effect. So basically, there's three things. Um, we're estimating a two thousand dollar increase in annual insurance. Uh, repairs for one of those famous tankers is, is estimated at $2,000 higher. And then we have a revenue item called insurance reimbursement. And basically that's an unknowable. Um, it's uh, sometimes if there's generally an accident that the fire has to come out and it's not local and there's some uh, costs that we can recover. Uh, however, uh, in the past, um, we haven't had that amount of revenue uh, mats our budget. So we trimmed the budget to maybe a, a little more realistic uh, value and that's $4,000. So those three things, um, that basically accounts for almost all the change, so. Thank you, Treasurer Duff. I mean, one of the things that uh, I've grown to realize in talking with different uh, people throughout the town, we, we rely on our fire service. We rely on our fire service for more than fire service. Um, we spend money uh, training our, our people and we buy uh, state-of-the-art equipment. And so when, when uh, some of our equipment uh, gets worn out, we, we budget and we buy new. And I, I mean, some of us, those are some, I'm tight to a couple of firemen and uh, those are some of the things that come back, uh, two or three of the reasons why uh, we do recruit well. I mean. I'm not sure when the last time was I've heard our chief say we're we're down in numbers to any great extent. And I mean, that that all has to do with our whole system, our leadership and our captains and our deputy uh, chiefs in our in our three fire halls and, and how they all work together. So one question, though, Chris, on the legacy provisions. So when we do grandfathering of our of our guys to bring their so they have a certificate to say they have been grandfathered, but we have to prove to somebody that they have the necessary training and everything that they are a legitimate grandfathered fire person. Is that true? Correct. So this is the first time we've seen in legislation that the fire marshal's office has said if we, the, the applications we send in, they will come and audit or they will audit 10% of the applications. And we've never seen that before. They've said they would, but they've never done it. This time they're saying it's an automatic 10%. So one of the reasons we bought the new software and I've deployed the new software is to be able to keep better records. So we have to show what they've been trained in the topic, how many hours they spent on it and what the objectives and uh, the skill sheets that they've participated and used. That all has to be part of the package. So we have a, a digital record of that, that um, we've been using and, and slowly implementing. Um, it's better than our old system, way better. And so we have that and we will hopefully be able to use that to just send them the records that they need for the audit once we get audited. So um, it, as they said, it's it's definitely the three legislative changes we saw last year were, were, uh, were big, so. Mm -hmm. Change. Any other questions for uh, Chris, Chief Harrell? All right, thank you for that. Uh, we're gonna move right along into uh, community services and we'll at, ask uh, Mr. Lubers to present. It looks to me like uh, yours has the longest list. Uh, I think there's 12 uh, behind, yeah. behind you, Matt. Thank you, Mayor Turton. There's an even dozen there and we'll, we'll try and get through them real quick here. So um, just with respect to the goals and objectives for this year, we tried to keep it simple as it's, uh, we're hoping to be a big planning year. Uh, so the Parks and Rec master plan that we started in early 2020, um, obviously COVID happened and that, uh, that got shelved. So we'd like to get through that plan this year. Uh, we'd also like to, with our asset management plan, um, get it completely updated and uh, implement that. And then in terms of program delivery and special event facilitation, we just like to have a normal calendar year without a shutdown, a lockdown, or <laughs> proof of vaccination or <laughs> any of that terminology. So um, yeah, just with respect to 2023, um, and just I'll go, I'll go one through 12 here. Uh, with our after school program, we are proposing a small increase 
And a lot of that's just to, uh, to make sure we look after our qualified and non-qualified staff. It is tricky to find people who are qualified or even non-qualified to work three to six, Monday to Friday. And uh, so we've got some great staff in place. We've, um, we've seen a lot of increase in registration at both sites. We've got some momentum going um, sort of where we were pre-pandemic and then uh, we kind of got sidetracked by that. So um, just a slight increase there. Uh, with, health and, with health and safety, we, we do have more defibs in um, public spaces and those require batteries and, and pads to be replaced on a regular basis. So we just wanna set aside a little bit more for that. Um, for the youth hub, uh, a slight increase there. Um, and that amount's also matched by Mapleton Township. And so what we do there now is we look after the non-staffing costs. So the lease, um, utilities, the cleaning, um, program supplies and, and whatnot. And that also includes a small amount uh, for the Minto Youth Action Council. So that, that group's sort of um, under the IYSN hub now and we give them a little bit of uh, budget to work with. Um, for the Norgan Theater, uh, that's typically a zero bottom line. And we are hoping um, whenever we finish in the black, whatever that amount is, we, uh, we tuck that into the Norgan Reserve account. So we're hoping uh, for 5,400 this year. In some of our gravy years, that was about 15 to 17,000, but we just wanna be careful that we don't get too far ahead of ourselves. Um, but uh, we did have a good finish to 2022 and we're hoping to carry that momentum into 23. Um, with parks amenities, um, there's not a whole lot of change there aside from allocating slightly more wages. And that's also similar under um, uh, parks. So parks amenities and parks, it's mostly just how we're allocating uh, the wages of our facilities operators. Um, for programs and camps, um, we're anticipating a very busy spring, summer and fall. Uh, day camp attendance levels last year were uh, at levels that we had never seen before. Um, we also had great turnout for grassroots programs, uh, pickleball and some other programming. And so uh, again, we're hoping for a, a good year there and, and we're actually proposing a slight decrease to the, to the net cost. Uh, for rec facilities, so this includes our uh, Palmerston and District Community Center, the Harrison Mental Community Complex, and then the Clifford Arena and the Clifford Hall. Um, yeah, we're looking to allocate uh, slightly more wages to this service area in 2023. We're also hoping to realize more uh, net uh, bar sales and bar revenue as the amount of licensed events increases um, and without restrictions, uh, we, 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 we did surpass uh, what we had budgeted for 2022. And um, under satellite facilities, just some modest increases to the expense lines there. Uh, we do have quite a few satellite facilities that uh, are under our care and control. Um, swimming pools, um, the big increase here is just to, to staff wages. So um, I think one of the things we talked about at council orientation is just, it's gonna be hard to recruit and retain lifeguards moving forward. Uh, a lot of places, um, last year either re significantly reduced their schedule or just didn't have a pool season altogether. Um, we definitely want to make sure we make every effort possible to, to not get into a situation where we don't have programming at our pools that we can offer to our residents. Um, so there's some slight increases there. And then with trails, there's, there's really not a whole lot to note there, just a slight increase. So, um, the two major drivers for uh, the increase would be that we are hoping to add one facilities operator position to our FTE complement. And the other one too under rec admin is that uh, we do have a significant portion of the town's insurance premium fall under our budget. And so we're anticipating a significant increase to our insurance as well, so. Any questions for Matt? Talking about uh, lifeguards uh, wages, um, how do we compare to, uh, I mean, you get out to visit and talk to other directors like yourself, are, are we there? Uh, in reference, I don't know, Listowel, maybe Drayton. So they, a, they, as everybody knows, Matt, they have a huge responsibility. So it's good to see that, uh, you know, in order to keep our pools open, we need to attract talent. 
Yeah, we're certainly in line with other outdoor pools. I'd say your indoor centers do pay a little bit more, uh, but they're they're uh, running 12 months out of the year. So, and one of the things that we've tried to do uh, and we've done for for as long as I've been here is we do help with um, existing staff. We we bring people in for training. We cover research costs, uh, affiliation fees, and things like that. So, um, in a given year, if you need to research your swim instructors and your NLS, I mean that's a couple hundred bucks and uh, that can, I mean, that's a, a lot of money for some. So we've typically uh, covered those costs. I know other municipalities have adopted that approach in the last couple of years. And um, if I didn't say it before, um, I just wanna just uh, with the previous council in 2020, we were faced with a tough decision of to whether to run the pools or not. A lot of places decided that uh, they re would remain closed. And that's really helped, I think us stave off this, this issue because we did retain all the staff. We didn't lay any of the lifeguards off that we had hired right before the pandemic hit. And I think that's given us a little bit more runway to help uh, avoid this problem. Any other questions? Okay. I think Mr. Mayor also just to add to what Matt's saying is um, one of the things that Matt and Quinn are both looking at is when you hire lifeguards that are university students and the pools don't open until June, they miss a whole month and a half of, of work. So look at, they're looking at ways to hire them when they're done school. And this might not be done this year, but in the future, and you know, council will, will see that, but to, to hire them that maybe they can work with public works or somewhere else for you to be deployed in the community for a month, because it's not fair. It's hard for university students to be hired to work at pools and, and not start till June. They're, they need the money. Um, speaking with children that are in college, they need all the money they can get. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's that's one thing to look for. And another thing they're looking at the possibility of in the future to be proactive as a municipality is uh, hiring them for multi-year contracts, depend, you know, pending uh, performance appraisals and that. So that if you're a student and, and you're hired and you're going to university, you know you have a job for the next two to three years. Um, whether that's a possibility or not, I don't know, but the two of them are, are looking at that and, and trying to be proactive with a lot of that stuff to help bring students back and to keep students here and, and to keep all our pools open. So good on them for looking at that kind of stuff and kind of outside the box type thing to, to keep things moving forward. Go ahead, uh, Councillor. Just to Elliott. back that up, there's been several pools around the area couldn't operate full level because they couldn't get the staff comp enough. That uh, has done very well at uh, keeping our people uh, abreast and in point. Actually, if we do that, uh, Chris is going to be higher at full, uh, full time healthy facilities. I think it would because they put a lot of money into houses and lifeguards. All of a sudden, the person that's working full time on other positions starts going down and they're losing money. Uh, training being that aspect of it. Professional, I thought, would amount of money as the, as the guy that was a labor expert. Yeah, it's great to see the pools open and, and full. So 100%. If there's no other questions, Matt, thank you very much. And we'll Thanks. move along to uh, um, yeah, okay, Mike, go ahead. But for some reason, uh, yeah, you're right there. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, roads Thanks. and drainage manager, Mike. Thanks, Mayor Turton. Yep, go ahead. Uh, Goals and objectives for us this year, uh, flood mitigation program. I think we'll be in a position this year where we should be able to come up with a financial plan based on um, the necessary works downstream in the watershed for that. Uh, we have contacted a couple of the primary residents just to see what they would be willing to accept on their property. So then we can come up with a, a scope of project and put a dollar value towards it for uh, future council consideration. Uh, some of the trail updates, um, there's some improvements that need to be completed. Ann Street and Clifford never got completed and behind those uh, vacant, or those lots that were developed up there, as well as we're seeing uh, more and more parking on the third line, the fifth line, seventh line, at the, where the trail enters on to the road there. Uh, so try to get them a more usable space just under the operating there. Um, an annual report, get our year in review completed for two, uh, 2022. Um, 
development approval process to coincide with the updates that the, the building department's working on with the bylaw and, and that stuff there, as well as uh, road use agreements. Try to get something formalized with utilities and uh, service providers. They come in and, and do work in the right of way without us really knowing what's going on from time to time. And then we're left with the damages, trying to figure out who is in doing what. So before I go too much further into the, uh, the budget, fuel was a big thing with us, about 75,000 in increases just with the unforeseen for this upcoming uh, year. Uh, so I'll start with cemeteries there. Um, one of the big items for this increase here is we had almost 25% more internments in our three cemeteries. Uh, usually we're sitting in around 70 to 80 um, internments for, for the entire season. This year we were up to 97 between the, all three cemeteries there. Um, municipal drains, we are seeing a decrease in this budget primarily. Um, we have a plan this year of bringing or taking back the uh, drainage superintendent um, that that position internally again. It's always it's been consult or we've had a consultant doing that for the last probably almost 12 years, if I remember correctly. So we're looking at taking that back in house, which if that position is 50% uh, grantable through OMAFRA. Um, roads admin, one of the big items there for this one is the insurance adjustment. Um, and then just various uh, expenditure adjust adjustments throughout. Sidewalk maintenance. Um, machine time, that's, that's offset sort of with the, uh, the, the whole fuel expenditure thing there too. And then hard, hard top sweeping and sidewalk walk repairs, those are increased. Uh, I'd have to look back for some reason, there was nothing allocated in the 22 budget for those two items. So this is just the actual for those two accounts primarily. Street lights. If I remember correctly on this, and Lord, you might be able to help me out. This is primarily the revenue produced from this is the cost savings from entering into the contract with real term for the LED lights. That's correct. <laughs> yeah, because our maintenance is minimal because it's almost all covered by the contract. Although with our growth, we have quite a few street lights that are not covered by the 2014 contract yeah, i think we're in year seven or eight now too but yeah we we keep it neutral and it's uh a separate special area rate on the levy so uh yes you're right and then we will be seeing more street lights coming into our in our uh, service uh with the uh, uh subdivisions and some of these extensions coming into play that where street lights are getting added Okay, uh, town, landscape, town landscape here. Uh, the, the primary increase here is uh, compensations where public works operators are actually being, helping that uh, division out more. Okay. Trailer parks is strictly revenue uh, for the Palmerston Trailer Park based on the amount of units there. 26 currently, and that's stayed status quo for a number of years. Uh, vehicle cost is uh, revenue produced by public works equipment, which we charge against other internal departments. Um, at the end of the year, ideally, this money would be there to use towards purchase of equipment for the following year. Um, in other, like sometimes, a, a, I guess uh, equipment repairs uh, may hamper that revenue being uh, there as well. Just for an example, uh, we just had to do a $60,000 repair on a transmission uh, for one of our graders, unfortunately. Winter control, uh, slight adjustments here. 
machine time charged. Uh, that's just uh, from the previous account. And then we did see a 5% salt increase uh, from last year to this year, which is uh, approximately an increase of $7,000 that we received for this, uh, this season. We typically respond to 75 to 80 weather events per year, per calendar year uh, with winter operations. Uh, just depending on the severity, it could be just sanding, it could be grading uh, some of the, the, the gravel road or plowing that storm that we just saw over the, the holiday season. I'd estimate that at uh, those two, three days, probably about $40,000 just in uh, recovering from that. Robertson Street here is uh, the ambulance bay, uh, which we charge to the EMS for the, the use of that facility. And that's it. If there's any questions. Questions for Mike? Can uh, Mike, the 2014 lights, Gord, when we put the lights in in 2014, that was a 10 year contract? That's right. So, can you just give us a. Sure. What's going to happen next year? We'll be in the next year, so we'll be fine. <laughs> it's going to uh, happen later on. Um, when those were put in, um, they were guessing there would be like 15 to 20 years' life. Nobody really knows because um, LED lights haven't been in. Um, just kind of academically or anecdotally, I'm not hearing that many complaints about maintenance compared to a few years ago. Um, if you remember when the contract first started, there was a lot of uh, <clears throat> jurisdictional disputes that something would go down and we'd say, here, it's your responsibility. Oh no, we don't cover that. Well, I think that's gotten resolved. I think we have pretty good uh, definitions of what is covered under the contract. Um, and just for the newer counselors, uh, that was roughly uh, just under a million dollar project um, because we had a lot of mercury vapor. We had the sodium, the, the orange glow. Um, a lot of work needed to be done on those street lights. Um, horribly energy inefficient in that too. But we did not have the million dollars and we didn't want to go out and borrow it. So. Um, this company, and it is uh, through LAS, which you're familiar with, uh, uh, AMO has a big hand in that. They were offering to front the money um, and the municipalities would get maybe five to 10% of the savings during the contract. And then after the 10 years, all the savings. And it does have a huge decrease in the cost of power. Um, as you know, there's more things to electricity than just the cost of power, but they are much more efficient um, and I think more reliable too. So um, I, th I think it was a really good uh, project. And of course it helps um, in our meeting greenhouse gas reduction goals, updating our energy plan and that too. And, and you know, uh, we're a growing community. I think if, if you drive through and you see all these old fashioned Cobras, you go, well, this isn't very progressive, but I, th I th even think like the quality of light is a lot better than, than what it was. So uh, yeah, on the whole, it's been a, a good deal and that's through realtor managing. Yeah, for sure. The light is definitely brighter and it's white rather than uh, yellow and orange. The uh, Palmerston Trailer Park, do we, do the land leases there, uh, are they similar to rent review? Like, can we increase uh, annually? increase or how's that work? I believe it is annually yeah Go ahead, uh, yes and it is covered by the rent review <clears throat> so we put it up by whatever that factor is um so it's still probably one of the most economical places to live but we put through what increases uh, that we can put through yeah okay thank you thanks thanks mike next up uh mr robertson wastewater service manager Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Drop my book. All right, we got the uh, wastewater operating budget today. Um, with the um, goals, we got to finish up the clarifier project in Palmerston. Um, work on our annual 
report uh, to bring to council for a year in review. Uh, simulated capacity studies in both uh, Harriston and Palmerston for uh, review what uh, we can do for future development at the wastewater treatment plants. And then as, uh, as Mike mentioned, uh, Public Works is working on our development uh, review process. And uh, we have the CLI ECA um, environmental compliance for stormwater and wastewater. Uh, actually just um, Monday morning, we received that uh, those are in place um, as, of, as of then. So um, we'll be working away this year at creating operation and maintenance, uh, operation and maintenance manuals and procedures to, uh, to meet the requirements in those environmental compliance approvals. Um, uh, yeah, so and, and overall, just uh, the purpose of the wastewater budget is to um, uh, operate the, the wastewater systems and provide a service to uh, all the residents that use them. Um, as mentioned earlier, the wastewater budget is a user pay and uh, cost recovery system. And overall, there hasn't been a lot of changes to the budget from the 2022 budget. Uh, I can just go over a couple of them. In overhead, we had some administrative uh, oversight changes. And we added some in engineering. Uh, most of that will be used up in the CLI ECA uh, maintenance manuals, making those. Uh, and then when we go into each system, uh, Clifford, Palmerston, and Harrison, it's the same theme throughout. Uh, we have insurance increases, tax increases, and then wastewater testing and treatment. Uh, the testing is uh, the the cost uh, increased cost from the the third party labs that we use. Um, we, you know we're required to send our samples out to them, and then treatment uh, is basically as Mayor Turton alluded to earlier. Chemical prices are have uh, shot up through the roof, and and uh, we need them to treat the water. So that's that's pretty well um, what all the increases are in the wastewater. Questions for Mark? Okay, well, thank you very much. Mr. Rogers, uh, <coughs> Water Services Manager. Thank you. So, yeah, going, going at the end here, most everything that I have has already been said, but I uh, will go through it. So for the, the water department, uh, next year we're looking, we'll have an annual review, of course, uh, and we're working on the development approval process. Uh, we're looking for an additional well in Harrison, so that's a fairly big project that will be taking up a lot of time over next year. Uh, a couple more things that i just like to mention for next year, we've got that new well going into Mineral Pines, so that'll be a big project for us. And then uh, with both water and wastewater, Staffing is always something we're working on. So we're looking at succession planning and trying to get, we're, we're looking at some different ideas about getting some licensed operators that maybe aren't in the department or elsewhere in the town so that we have those, those options going forward. Uh, as far as budget, there, there are some increases and I, I feel it's kind of like a broken record <coughs> just talking about what Mark talked about here, but uh, much the same pressures. Uh, utilities going up, so both water and wastewater we use a lot of hydro to do what we do. Chemical prices going up uh, is a big thing. And then also we, we have a lot of facilities, so insurance costs have went up and that pretty much covers the, the challenges that we're gonna be facing over the next year. So if there's any questions related to the water budget? Questions? Go ahead. Just to add to what the three Public Works fellows had to say, and Todd just touched on it that one of the things through the planning process or strategic planning and that that we're going to do this year is look at staffing levels for public works. Um, you can imagine more houses, more industry, more growth that we're having is putting a lot more pressure on those three. Um, Mike had a hard time rounding out his winter plow operators this year. Um, thank goodness we have people part time that keep coming back but it's definitely something that's going to be looked at this year and it's a pressure that's going to be on them to see. So you will see future reports that will have budget implications in the future, but as we grow, so does everything else. So it's, it's a lot of pressure on those guys and they've maintained and done a fantastic job with 
maintaining staff levels. Um, but it's definitely something through the planning process this year that we want to look at and be ready for. So. We looking at uh, co-ops, May 1st, co-op students, anything like that? Do we, we, ha we have done that in the past, do we? Um, yeah, we have in the past. Uh, we haven't, uh, we haven't put out a, an applic or a position for a co-op student this year. Um, we haven't done it since basically uh, COVID, but um, yeah, we, we still have all the contacts with, uh, with the schools and that's something we can definitely explore. Any other questions? Hearing none, then uh, non-departmental. Gord, do you, uh, you want to talk Sir, about Sir, it's uh, <clears throat> probably the simplest one. It's one item. It's our OMPF grant. And as I say, it, it went down by 33,000. Um, it's about where it was uh, 10 years ago, but at least it's still there. And uh, I know uh, other municipalities uh, <clears throat> have been impacted, both positively and negatively. And uh, I would say it's kind of a, <clears throat> there's a formula and it's very transparent what it is, uh, how rural we are, that hasn't changed too much, but also average household income and average assessment. And on the good news front, that's going up. Are we becoming a little more prosperous than that too? But for purposes of this formula, it does tend to reduce the assistance you get. But uh, I, know, I, I think uh, the government has heard the message that this is a very important program. And uh, I know there was talk of what, about five years ago of phasing it out, but um, uh, it's certainly, uh, ourselves and, and many other municipalities really depend on that. And uh, it would be very hard to do the services without it. I think the important thing as well, I mean, that, that where you spent your time today uh, with our minister and our, and our MPP, that's a, great, uh, that's a great opportunity for us as a small uh, rural municipality to stay informed and uh, let them know exactly what it is we need. So. I mean, that's a, an advantage this weekend. Uh, Roma is uh, happening in uh, Toronto at the Sheridan Centre, and there's a few of us going. So I'm sure it's going to be all about Bill 23. So many unknowns. Change. So I've been on. Is there, is there any other questions? On behalf of the council, I mean, we're, we're very fortunate to have a, a well-rounded staff that uh, brings the budget to us uh, every year with the support of our CAO and uh, our treasurer. And again, we, we just wanna thank you guys for doing this. Uh, very few questions, you guys go through it extremely well every year and uh, we appreciate that. So I'm not sure if we're gonna give you a clap, but, <laughs> but thank you. Other, any other questions for anybody? Hearing none, we'll move right along then. Uh, Resolution moved by Councillor Gunson, seconded by Councillor Potnovitz, that the Committee of the Whole convenes into regular council. All in favor of that? That's carried. Thank you. Uh, Notice of motion. Uh, well, there's no bylaws. Um, uh, moved by Councillor Zimmerman, seconded by Deputy Mayor Anderson, that the Council of the Town of Minto adjourn to meet again at the call of the Mayor. So we're, we're looking forward to the 17th when uh, sorry, the 21st, 21st of February. Uh, we'll be talking about the operating budgets again. Any changes that have came forward? Possibly Gord's discussion today with our minister. He might uh, send us some more money. <laughs> Don't hold your breath. So on that particular day as well, February 21st, we'll do our capital budget. So again, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, for being here and uh, helping us through this budget process. All in favor of adjournment. That's carried. Thank you. <laughs>